Thank you. And um, I want to share my screen with you because it says welcome. And I, I may forget to say that if I don't have it up on the screen. Um, I want to um, go through some housekeeping chores and then um, get started. Uh, I want to um, invite anybody who wants to come closer. Um, I don't throw things generally. Um, and so and you also find that uh, I may have a sense of humor once in a while. Um, <clears throat> housekeeping. Uh, thank you. If you've got distractions, and this goes for both the folks on Zoom and the folks uh, here live, um, telephone ringers, um, interruptions. I heard a baby earlier. Um, if you can mute all of them, there's a mute switch on the baby also. Um, anything that keeps you from being fully present, and again, for the folks on Zoom, anything that keeps that, that you would be doing that would be distracting for someone else, they would appreciate it if you didn't do that. This would mean, there was, there were, I've been on Zooms where people are just walking from room to room. That's great, you can do that, but turn your video off. Yeah, I, we're getting seasick here. Um, so uh, if you could do that, that would be good. Um, we are recording, you got the Zoom, um, uh, uh, info and also here live, we are recording, which means that when we get to Q&A, when we get to small group work, etc., please monitor yourselves. Um, I didn't mean to say that, I didn't know it was being recorded. You now know it's being recorded, so say what you th think is appropriate for the time. Um, <clears throat> This can mean starting your video, starting your audios, turning it off, being appropriate uh, in that way. I was um, on a Zoom call and the, somebody on the call was eating potato chips. And it's kind of like, if you didn't bring enough to share, you need to turn your audio off. Um, this happened about three or four months ago. Uh, we were on a Zoom call, um, and it wasn't a hybrid. It was like all Zoom. And <clears throat> the person um, on the call had a cat. And the cat jumped in her lap, which cats are known to do, to get petted. And she was petting the cat, and the cat was turned around, completely centered on the camera. This was, and, and, and of course we're recording. So this is like, you know, the cat butt video here. Um, yeah, <laughs> watch your video or don't watch that one. <laughs> um, I'm not sure we're gonna do breakouts because we've got so much information uh, today. Um, however, if we do, I'm gonna ask people get into your breakout rooms quickly and start participating quickly. I don't know why people do this kind of polite thing of, mm, I'll let somebody else go first. Uh, maybe that person over there will talk. You know, it's like, no, no, just j dive in because the breakout room will only have a certain amount of time. Uh, if you need to ask questions, uh, both this is true both here in the room and true on Zoom, um, you need to raise your hand. Now, raising your hand can be on Zoom, raising your digital hand, putting up a little, your, your little digital signpost. Um, it can also mean waving your meat hand around until somebody recognizes that you're, you're waving your hand around. And so, um, uh, so whether you're in the room or whether you're on Zoom, waving your hand around till we acknowledge you is something that'll work. If you, try, if you try to ask me a question, I may put you off for several minutes until we get to that segment. Okay, so 
I'll just say, I'll hang on for a second and I'll go on to something else and come back to you, hopefully. If I don't remember to come back to you, you'll wave your hand around again. Um, I cannot see the chat. In order to put the chat on, I have to find the different, the, the close up glasses, not these are the far away glasses. Um, and um, I don't want to dig for them. And you don't want to see me hunched down like this trying to figure out what somebody is writing. So um, Rebecca is going to be monitoring the chat box um, and, and we'll probably call on you or ask your question for you when those times are appropriate. Um, my language, uh, I, <clears throat> There are times when I will use language that is um, that people may find separating offensive, um, not uh, exactly the king's English. And if I'm doing that, I'm doing it for an effect. I'm not doing it to into um, demean, degrade. Uh, I'm doing it because. That's what was quoted to me. Um, and um, I ask you to be conscious of that. I'm not being, um, uh, I'm not slighting anyone. I've got books for sale. And um, one of the things that you need to do for me is take some of these books so I don't have to carry them all back. Um, and I see a number of you walked in here with creating a world that works for all. Yay, you get extra points. You didn't even know you were getting any points, did you? Um, I've done a series that is speculative fiction, my one and only foray into speculative fiction. And we'll talk about this a lot later, but the Chronicles of the Upheavals is book one. The Chronicles of the Awakening is book two. The Chronicles of the Transformation is still in my head somewhere. I keep trying to knock it loose and it's, it's starting to, I, I'm starting to get some movement there. Um, and one of the most recent books uh, is Practicing Wisdom. Um, this is, um, uh, well, all of these are long in the making. Um, and a book I don't have with me is, um, besides the copy I'm giving to Rebecca, is Practicing the 12 Steps of Inclusivity. This is a workbook. and. Uh, it's, we talk about how we're connected to others, but this is a test to see whether you really are or not. See whether or not we are connecting, not just with the popular, but, all, but, but connecting with all living beings. So I have to keep remembering, I'm just in housekeeping now. Um, like I said, the third hour, uh, we, we're going until six o'clock to eight o'clock. And then I'm gonna stick around as, if there's any people here who wanna stick around with me to talk about um, some things I'm not gonna have time to cover today, but also to talk about um, what you want to talk about, like to, to go deeper into some of the, the, the topics that we've got here. So um, uh, now, as for Zoom, I don't know if we can stay longer on that channel. And Rebecca's nodding, which means we can stay longer on the channel. So we are going to have a formal ending because I know some people, you've made other plans, you've got other places to go. Uh, that'll be a time for you to go ahead and sign out if you're going to sign out of Zoom at the top of, of the eight o'clock hour or whatever hour you've got because some of you are calling in from other places. 
Um, and, um, uh, and then after a few minutes, we're just gonna start right back up again. Um, I, I, so I said at the top of the hour, we'll take a break. Um, I wanna say a word about uh, spirituality. I will talk about that a lot tonight, but I want you to know that I am not talking about religion. You know, when I, so when I talk about spirituality in this country, people get twitchy like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an atheist or I'm a, and I'm, I, I don't believe in it. And I do believe in that. So um, I will go into this more later, but this is not a selling job for any particular denomination or anything like that. This is to get us back to the root of the root of ourselves, which we will find is also the root of the all. Um, this is a prayer that uh, I do in the beginning of um, my sessions, and I do at the end of my sessions. Um, it's, a, it's a modification of a Buddhist prayer. And this is as non-denominational as you can get. Uh, the atheists in our organization can do this prayer. And it's very, it's very simple. May I be well. May I be secure. May I be happy. May you be well. May you be secure. May you be happy. May all beings be well. May all beings be secure. And may all beings be happy. And when we end, I'm going to invite those who wish to do that to join me. Um, <clears throat> and there's a pad around here somewhere. Okay, so now we're ready, ready to get started here. <laughs> this is from the Buddha. The eyes only see what the mind is prepared to comprehend. What I'm going to do tonight is hopefully get you prepared to comprehend a larger world, a bigger world. We, we feel that we're, we may be pushing the envelope right now in terms of how expanded our world is. However, our world has been confined to the space of our culture and the space of our experiences. What we need to do is expand that. We need to cut, take out our filtering. The information that we know is filtered to us and we don't even see the, the, the filters. This is one of the things that um, uh, practicing the 12 steps of inclusivity covers. How much you can't see just because your filters are jammed up. So what do we know about the bubonic plague? You studied it when you were in high school, maybe even uh, middle school. You know that it was very significantly wiping out um, large parts of, um, of Europe. Um, the, uh, and, and there were places like uh, Milan um, and this place uh, between France and uh, Spain that were not touched by it, but the rest of it got touched. And that's about what you learned. And so I grew up thinking that the bubonic plague was a European disease. Bubonic, the bubonic plague wiped out most of the human population in the world. But all of the people in Asia, in Africa, in India, all those folks, we don't talk about them. It didn't matter to them. What mattered to, was to the people who are doing the research and your teachers who are following that research. And then they followed the research and followed it, and they all followed it in one area. So what we have to do is unlearn that, is see a wider world. 
Now, in a lot of the um, studies that are happening right now in uh, uh, various places, and actually pr probably right here on campus with, um, you know, unlearning racism and things like that, that is really helpful. And it doesn't go far enough. We've got to be able to comprehend the whole thing, not the politically correct thing. So we all know the story about um, Columbus um, <laughs> um, getting significantly lost and crash landing in, 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 the, uh, uh, in North America. And um, the story that the native people who were uh, on the shore could not see their ships because they'd never seen human artifacts that big. If you remember the movie, if you saw the movie uh, Gladiator, um, when the gladiators were taken into Rome and they first saw the Colosseum, and one of them said, I didn't know human beings could make something that big. It's like five stories high. Uh, I had that feeling when I went to Egypt and saw the pyramids. How many of you have seen the pyramids with your own eyes? Uh, no, for, <laughs> for a reason. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it, it is, it, it, I'm slightly claustrophobic, okay? claustrophobic enough to say there's a really interesting stuff on the outside here and um but every single one of you should go because your mind will freeze over when you see it it is it is um almost too large to comprehend and we owe it to ourselves regardless of who created it, to look at what human beings can do once we set some things in motion that we'll be talking about in one hour. I have another uh, story. Uh, and I've always doubted the legitimacy of that interpretation. Okay, so, so you're saying, but did, the, did, did the people in Zoom hear that comment? Um, I'm not seeing. I'm not. I'm not seeing the chat. So can. So I'm trusting incredible um, understanding of um, mathematics and um, astronomy and celestial navigation, and I've always really doubted that interpretation. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you my story. I find that complicated. That's um. I will, I will be glad to give you my story, which um, happened to me and my daughter, right at the, the same consciousness. But first, um, there's some, some um, anthropologists took um, the rainforest people in Central Africa, uh, the Pygmies, to uh, a clearing and showed them off in the distance, uh, a herd of elephants, and asked them, what do, what's your word for these beings here? And they gave the word for beetles, because from their point of view, they, had, they were looking at a wall about 20 feet away from them, and these little things, were crawling and they just, just some bugs or some beetles. They had never seen a distance larger than 50 feet and it's showing, some, showing them something miles and miles away. So my story, where's my story? Okay, my story, um, I was, um, living in, in uh, Portland, Oregon, um, my youngest daughter, Zainab, 
was um, seven years old. And so she came out to visit me. And I took her to my favorite hiking place on um, uh, near Lotaro Falls. Lotaro Falls, anybody? Yay. And um, beautiful area. And so she's walking with me. What just happened? <laughs> um, I think your system is possessed. I, that, that, that's my solution. Uh, um, she, um, I, we're walking together. And as we're walking along, she says, there's a gum wrapper. And we walk a little further and she says, oh, there's a beer can. And she's walking, we're walking a little further and she says, there's a tissue. And I realized at seven years old, she could not see the trees. So I took her off the path and I said, this is a tree, put your hand on it. And she had a relationship to rough. So you know, oh, that's really rough. I said, look up. And she has a, has a relationship to height because she's seen like high buildings and things like that. Oh, that's really tall. I said, okay. So I'll go to the next one. I said, here's another tree. Put your hand on it. And look up. You walk to a third tree. I said, okay, here's another tree. Put your hand on it and look up. And she looked up and she took her hand off and her jaw dropped. And she does this 360 degree turn. And she says, look at all of these trees. Until that moment, she was walking in a green room with a beer can and a tissue and a gum wrapper. If you if you've never been introduced to it, how can you see it? If you have no expectation of it, how can you see it? So what we have to do is open our minds to the point that we can see the things that are, that are in front of us. <clears throat> And I'm trying to figure out, oh, that was the green room. We have a problem. The problem is our story. It's a problem on a number of different levels. On one level, it's dysfunctional. On the other level, we treat it as though it's the only story that possibly can exist. So we, in the next hour or so, are gonna be opening our eyes to a whole different kind of story, a whole new way of thinking about the world, ourselves, each other, and our future. So what is our current story? Current story is really simple. Let's kill this planet. A guy by the name of uh, Stafford Beer said, the purpose of a system is what it does. Regardless about, of all of the, we're making things better. It does it. What, we're, what the, or the overall effect of all of our actions is to kill the planet. If anybody thinks that's a good story, you probably should leave now. Go watch a TV show. Doesn't even matter. We go watch SpongeBob SquarePants. Okay. Um, if you're on the Zoom, just go ahead and click, click another channel, any other channel. Save yourself some time. We have to dump the story and all of that which comes with it. Now, some of you think that you have dumped the story. You traded it in for a different story. And that different story is let's kill the planet slower. That's called the sustainability uh, plan. Let's kill the planet. Let's actually save the earth as long as it doesn't cost too much, as long as we don't have to do very much to change ourselves, as long as we don't have to change our lifestyles, as long as we don't have to go to too many meetings. Yeah, it's, it's we're, we're, we're really, we're deeply committed. 
Let's do all that we can to save the earth. As long as we don't have to change our basic attitudes, as long as we don't change our assumptions, as long as we don't have to get any less money, you know, that won't work. The guy with the really cool beard, he said, I sit on a man's back, choking him and making him carry me. And yet assure myself and others that I am very sorry for him. And I wish to ease his lot by any means possible, except getting off his back. So Leo Tolstoy. We are sitting on the back of the world. We will either get off voluntarily and start doing something different, or we're going to get thrown off. And we probably won't like the second option. So what is this problem? What is, the, what, is the, what is the basis of this story? It's way larger than climate change. It's way larger than racism, sexism, homophobia, the whole nine yards. It's way bigger than COVID. It's way bigger than politics. It's way bigger than any of that stuff. We have to, people make a mistake. And the mistake that they make when they're hearing my work is they're trying to stuff it into one of the convenient boxes that they've got. So they'll listen and they'll say, oh, he said something about climate change. Just, he's a climate change activist. Or he said something about you know, racism and social justice. Well, he's a, he's a social justice activist. There is no box that this fits in. Okay. You got to come up with a whole new box. And if you really have a problem with that, then the, guy, the people that walked out on the first part, they you can just follow them out. That's called a joke. You're, you're only looking really grim here. What is the problem? I got my undergraduate degree at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is famous for psychology. And psychology at the time that I went to uh, Clark had to do a lot with fractionating rat brains. Um, and not only did we kill them, we tortured them before we, uh, we, 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 we killed them. So we had an experiment. Take two rats, put them in a cage, make the cage big enough, make the, uh, put adequate food and water in the cage and the rats, the two rats will cohabit. If it's a male and female rat, they'll do more than cohabit, but you try, we try to keep the experiment simple. So you put two male or two female rats in the uh, cage and the, the cage is metal. So what we do is we send a mild electric shock through the, the floor of the cage. So the two rats are in pain they will immediately attack each other. All they know is I'm in pain and there's another rat. That rat in some way must be causing my pain. So let's take one of the rats and make them white and make the other rat black. And everybody is standing outside the cage, cage is saying, oh, look, these white, and, uh, white rats and black rats, they can't get along with each other. And we have to do social programs to get, to get them to understand and do inclusivity work. And, and then when you get the rats to rear up on their hind legs and go out in the streets and start fighting each other, you still don't ask the question, what is the nature of the shock that's going through the cage, that other rat's not your problem. You've got a bigger problem, the one that's causing the pain. And at some point in time, you're gonna stop listening to all the other folks saying, oh no, it is that other rat. Y'all should keep fighting each other. And you know, let's turn up the juice and see what happens. So we need to be focused on the bigger picture.
as most of us know that the, 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 the largest part of the volume of an iceberg is under the waterline. Nine tenths of it is under the waterline. So we keep focusing on the visible stuff. We keep focusing on global climate change. We focus on the, the George Floyd murder. We focus on COVID and we keep ignoring what's under the waterline. Something that in my book, Creating a World That Works for All, I call the mess. Uh, one of my more eloquent moments. The mess is all of our mega crises. They're all connected. They're all linked together. Uh, each one of them is intractable and all together they are a mess. So what is the mess? For those of you who have the book, you know that there are 50 things, I think it's on page 35, that point to the mess. Uh, political corruption, homelessness, racism, urban deterioration, civil wars, sexism, greed and fraud, pesticides, colonialism and neocolonialism, genocide, unsustainability in every aspect of space, blah, 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 blah. This is the stuff that is plaguing us. And the most important thing about this is, these are not 50 problems. Because a lot of you are thinking, oh, well, we're doing something about public school violence. Uh, we're doing something about pandemics. Um, we're doing something about you know, overgrazing. We're doing something about... We're treating each one of those things as a separate problem. These are not 50 problems. This is one problem. It's got 50 or more presenting symptoms, but it's only one problem. That problem is consciousness. None of these problems, none of these symptoms could exist without the consciousness framework to support it. I have that consciousness framework. You have that consciousness framework. If you try to take apart one little part of that framework, it doesn't work that way. You've got to look at the whole thing, which is what we're doing over the next 20 minutes. We've been trying to change or ignore the symptoms and not trying to address the disease. You get a spot on your arm, so you put a Band-Aid on it, and then your arm rots off because you don't understand what's going on inside of the arm. Einstein said, no problem can, that can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. How many of you know that quote? A good number of you, okay? What do we see people trying to, help, trying to solve the problems? We get the people who created the global climate change phenomena, put them in the room and say, will you please solve that? And then we wonder why they can't do it. Those are the people that created it. You have to elevate consciousness in order for them to change it and nobody's elevating anything around here. It's not about carbon in the atmosphere. It's not about the ecology. It's not about global warming. It's not about sustainability. It's about consciousness. It's not about skin color. It's not about gender or orientation. It's not about religion. It's about consciousness. I've been doing this for about 30 years. I would think that people would be so sick and tired of me saying this over and over again. They'd just go and change their consciousness just to get me to shut up, okay? Um, that hasn't happened yet. So once the, our solution is consciousness, once we change our consciousness, giving birth makes sense. We're changing our story. And the change is, that we are birthing a new society. We can look right now at all of the problems that are 
the that are are challenging our existing civilization. We're looking at political instability. We're looking at economic instability. We're looking at all these things. Many people are feeling depression, despair, suicide rates go up, drug and alcohol use goes up, it's time for us to recognize that something is happening. <clears throat> I am going to, this, this is the place where I would be asking you a question and breaking you into groups. I'm not gonna do it on this question. Um, I'm, um, I'm recognizing that I'm coming up on half my time gone and I'm just, I'm still in the warm up phase here. Um, We are about to give birth. We're about to give birth to a new form of consciousness. Um, you don't have to take pictures of the slides. I'm going to give um, Rebecca a. Hmm? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll stay out of this then. But I'll, I'll finish. I'll finish what I was going to say. Uh, I'm going to give. Um, uh, Rebecca, a PDF of the slide so that you don't have to be writing furiously if you want to refer back to them. Um, um, so we're birthing a planetary consciousness. For those of you who know anything about the birth process, now, all of you participated at one time, <laughs> but for those have, who, has, who has seen or participated in the birth process as a functioning humanoid, like beyond 12 years old. And um, are you, how many of you have done that as mothers? Okay, so if I say anything, I'm, I've never been a mother. So if I say anything that is um, uh, wrong, you can, you know, uh, just keep it to yourself. Um, but anyone who's seen the process and anyone who has who has delivered a baby knows it is a messy, yucky, painful process. And then you get a baby. And uh, I, like I said, I, I uh, my part in and um, the baby part was I was I had the catcher's mitt and I was ready to ready to ready to uh, catch. Um, and yes, it is messy and yucky. And um, my wife at the time, um, while she's screaming and yelling her head off, was blaming me. You did this to me. You made all this happen. <laughs> so. Um, but as soon as you get the baby in your hands, all that disappears. She said, while she was in labor, I'll never have another baby. Two weeks later, I mean, it wasn't even two months, two weeks later, she's like, oh, let's do another one. I'm like, uh, okay. You went through that process because you know what having a baby means. As soon as you say, I'm having a baby, you know, messy, gunky, yucky, back hurt, labor, and then you get a baby. If you didn't know you were having a baby, you would think that you were dying. How do I say that? Because a couple of years ago, a woman in Uganda um, was having a baby. And um, when all the drippy, messy, gunky parts start happening, her husband takes her to the hospital and she does the yelling and the screaming and does all that other stuff. And then out pops a baby and they wrap it up in a blanket and they take it home. 
A week later, she's going through a lot of pain in her abdomen. So much pain that the husband takes her back for, to the emergency ward and she is yelling and screaming. And the one thing they know is that she's not having a baby, so let's get her open and find out what's all this about. And as they're prepping her for emergency surgery, out pops another baby. She's one of the rare women who had two wombs. Husband got her pregnant in both of them a week apart. And she delivered the second baby, which was not a twin. It's a whole separate womb. I tell this story for this reason. Until we birth a new society, it feels like this one is dying. It has to feel that way because it has to die to make room for the next one. That uh, story about the uh, Ugandan mother, this happened you know, like a, you know, maybe four or five um, uh, women with, out of the hundreds of millions of women who have had babies have had two wombs. One of them, a uh, woman in, a young woman in um, England, was not married, having sex with her boyfriend, and kept a very careful record of her period. So that when she started getting all these pains in her abdomen, she knew something was wrong and she goes to the hospital and the first thing they ask her is, are you pregnant? And if she says, I've had you know, eight months of, of uh, menstrual cycles here, I'm not pregnant. So they start doing to her every possible thing they shouldn't do to a pregnant woman. Uh, you know, stuffing her with muscle relaxants. Um, everything they do to her throws her into a coma. And while she's in the coma, out pops a baby. And a week later, she comes out of her coma and she, they say, well, glad to see you're back from your coma and here's your baby. They say it took her a bit to, um, to bond with this baby. Um, so my friend, the late Barbara Marks Hubbard has a story. And, is, and in this story, um, she talks about a scientist. And this scientist happens to be a fetus in the womb. And the scientist is doing what scientists do, which is measure their environment. And the scientist is measuring and has an alarming statistic. And that is that as that the, that the baby is growing faster than the nutrients going into through the umbilical cord. This is concerning, so they, so they do more testing. And the, all the testing is showing the same thing. And so the scientist says, okay, well, I'll just try to grow slower. I'll try to, to, to conserve nutrients. Maybe I'll, I can build another um, umbilical cord. And when a scientist gets to about the eighth month, they, they are resigned to death. They know they're going to die because the scientist has never experienced anything called birth. So that's what our experience is right now. To not stop the pain. To not stop the dislocations to not stop the, the challenges that we've got, but to understand how this gets us to the point of birthing a new society. So where is your focus? I can tell you that in this society, almost no one is focused on the baby, almost everybody is focused on the afterbirth. They will tell you about all of the problems that make up 
the what's going on. They'll talk about the pain. They'll talk about the yuckiness. They'll talk about all this other stuff. They don't want to talk to you about a baby. And um, I guess I should ask this as a question for the mothers that we have in the room right now. How long did it take you to um, forget about the pain and really get focused in on that baby? Instantly, it's, I, sometimes I've heard like, you know, a minute, you know, um, but it is, it is, you know, when you see the woman, the, you know, they come out covered in yuck. Okay, so here's your, here's your, your yucky baby. And the, the, this mother is so happy, she's crying. She's like, oh, this is so great. And so, what about the, oh, no, don't, don't worry about that. Um, and, but there are two things that come out of a woman at the time of birth. Um, don't forget about this one, okay? <clears throat> when I saw this, this picture of a placenta, um, it reminded me of a, of a saying that's true, that's true in many different religions about the tree of life. Now, when most people see um, placentas, they go, ew, yuck, eh. Okay. Now, if it wasn't for that, you don't get that. Some cultures, will honor the placenta to the point of uh, burying it in a ceremony. And when they bury it, to bury it with a tree seed. And so when the tree grows up, we know that that tree is growing up with the nutrient bath of that baby. Um, I had a friend who um, her father planted a tree every time um, one of his children was born. And in the front yard, you just have these, this, this stack of trees, which is really cool. I'm, I would like you to spend as much time focusing on the baby as we do on um, the problem. I want you to spend more time focusing on the baby than you do with the problem. Uh, number one, thank you for, for thank you for reading the question. Number two, thank the midwife for raising the question. Uh, number three, um, I exaggerate. Okay, and and uh, I hope that you got that from oh, messy. Oh yuck! It's and I have had people, actually, some of them in the room right now. <laughs> Um, who, who do have that reaction to seeing an, a, a, a placenta, who do have that reaction to um, the uh, breaking of the water, to, to all of that stuff. It's, it's um, uh, number one, it is beautiful. Number two, it is really cool. Number three, uh, you have to... Um, um, you have to expand into that into that concept, and um, uh, I can pat myself on the back. Yes, I did as a father. Uh, and number two, um, uh, looking at it in terms of the analogy of our society, don't get too bogged down in the mess. Okay, so. Rebecca, reading my mind, knows that the, what we're now going to talk about is the three different types of consciousness. I always find it interesting. I find this, this to be one of the most fascinating parts of, um, excuse me. I find this to be one of the most fascinating parts of the, um, I, I was right the first time. Um, of the presentation 
and we don't get a lot of pushback. Uh, we think that, excuse me. We think that, um, for some reason, my screen doesn't want to share. I'm going to start all over. Da -da. So, um, it's like we don't accept the notion that different people can have a different frame of reference for consciousness. That I can think differently, that I can see the world differently in the book i talk about three different kinds of consciousness keepers breakers and menders how many of you have read uh, daniel quinn's book ishmael one okay i won't talk about it anymore then um, um, the keepers are the people that we call indigenous people. These are the people that um, stay close to the sacred hoop. These are the people who see themselves as one with the earth. The breakers are those who say, I'm above the earth. I'm above all these other beings on the earth. I, I can use them, but I'm not, I, I, I'm not part of them. And that includes being over other human beings. And then the third group is the menders. Those of us who have been raised as breakers. I have, I have, I have certificates from breaker, breakerology, okay? But I also know that our path is a path where, that has to include a different kind of consciousness. <clears throat> so the keepers are people who have always lived within the earth's tolerances. The keepers are those who see themselves as part of the earth's family. They, 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 they use the term all my relations. And they use that term around the world. The breakers are those who want to live on top of the earth, not with it. Those who treat the earth like their playground, their piggy bank, and their cesspool. Those who practice exclusivity. I am separate. I am separate from all of you. I'm separate from all of those beings out there, the crawling ones, the swimming ones, the green ones, etc. I am separate. The menders are those who see themselves as part of the earth, not apart from it. So our thinking is moving to in alignment with those we call indigenous people. Those who pledge to live sustainably. Those who pledge to mend the damage caused by the breakers. This is an important point. I didn't create this mess but I'm the one that has to clean it up. And each of you should be saying that. We spend so much time trying to point our fingers to the people who have made the mess. If they really have made the mess, they can't hear you. They can, it's, it's, it's like talking to your dog, okay? Like you can say, blah, 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 blah. And the dog doesn't understand a word. A dog is looking at you like, you know, I, I know come in, go out and sit and, and, and you know, roll over. I don't know the rest of these words here. We are the ones who practice inclusivity, that we are one. We are one, first of all, first of all, within ourselves. How many of us 
are self-loathing? How many of us are self-negating? I can't do this, I'm not doing that, etc. How many of us um, are going too slowly in this presentation? <laughs> um, we need to see ourselves as one. I need to see myself as one with all other human beings, including ones that I may not uh, agree with. I've done some interesting work in all around the world. I've done I've done information gathering and negotiation with people who are parties to war, both sides, listening to both sides and, rec and, and, and recognizing what I'm hearing, that what, hap what sounds like um, racism or sounds like sexism is a deep fear inside, a fear of the other. Okay, I'm, I really, I'm, I'm going to move faster. These are the people who are putting no load on the planet. These are the people, uh, and William Catton's research said the earth could be, could have billions and billions and billions of these folks without there being, um, uh, with, and, and be able to do that sustainably. Now, these are the folks who are putting all the strain on the planet. These are the folks who, um, according to William Catton, if these are Americans, the world cannot sustainably work for even all Americans, let alone anybody else on the planet. And this cute little baby is consuming more resources than an entire village in Africa. They didn't ask for it. They don't know anything about it. And what we have to do is change, not the people, but the system. And we've got to change that system based on a different level of consciousness. Okay, so we've looked at the keepers. We looked at the breakers. What do the menders look like? Well, looks like all those people. Because once you change your consciousness, your outside doesn't change. You don't grow, you know, another arm. You don't have another, you know, you don't, don't grow antlers. You know, you look the same, but you do something different and you act in a different way. What you act with is what I'm calling functional and hol holonic consciousness. Um, this is where we start getting to the good stuff. And for those of you who have been uh, with me before, um, this is the stuff that you haven't gotten before. Um, the word holonic is, met, is based on the word holon, which is a word that Arthur Kessler uh, coined. Um, a holon is something that is whole unto itself. It's made up of smaller holes. And then it goes to make up larger holes. So it's in the middle of the stream of whole beings. Um, your best example is me or you or, um, or the chair you're sitting in. I am made up of a number of different elements, smaller elements, skin, eyes, heart, organs. I won't go any further. Um, 
I go on to make up larger organ organs. Um, my apartment in Portland, the city of Portland. I'm a, I am a citizen in the city of Portland. So I go to make up Portland. I'm part of these larger things that gets even larger state of Oregon, um, North America, United States, I should say. Um, your chair is made up of wood, screws, metal, but it goes to make up a larger hole called an auditorium. And so, and that's part of this building, that's part of this campus, that's part of, so the consciousness that you have, the consciousness that pretty much I have is an individualized consciousness. You have been taught that your consciousness stops right at the, at the border of your skin and that somebody, uh, that, that you look at me and I've got a different consciousness and the only possible way you can tell what's in my consciousness is to hear the words flapping out of my mouth because you can't read what's going on in my consciousness. Because you've been taught that, you can't. Remember what the Buddha said when I first, what I said when I first started. You know, your eyes are ready to, to comprehend when you've been trained, this is opening the door to that training. So rethinking consciousness. First of all, this is the organ of consciousness. It isn't your brain. It's your brain and heart. And they're connected. And they're connected in ways that until this past decade, researchers never ever even thought about. We never thought about the consciousness of your heart. And that's why so many people are walking around here heartless without a connection to their heart. The heart will tell you all the things that you shouldn't be doing and, <laughs> and you, um, if you don't know how to listen, you'll never get it. Consciousness, most researchers will tell you, is an accident of brain activity. Because our brains are so big and there's so much activity going on, humans are conscious, dogs are probably not. Um, cats are conscious, but on a completely different planet. Um, until about 150 years ago, those same researchers or their ancestors would tell you, I'm not consciousness, I'm not conscious. Black people don't have a consciousness, they don't have a soul. They, they're, they, 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 they're like a horse or a dog that can talk. Because breakers got it wrong and have gotten it wrong for such a long, long, long time, um, there's a uh, tendency to keep getting it wrong. <laughs> so consciousness is not an accident of brain reactivity. Consciousness is not located in your brain. The brain heart organism is the receiving agent, the receiving organ for consciousness. And consciousness is not limited to humans. So we talked about holonic, that, that it's that you're part of larger holes, you're part of smaller holes. Let's talk about the functional part. I think that our con consciousness has not been functional yet. I think it's about to become functional. And when it becomes functional, I think we should look out. Um, <clears throat> I think that we can remove the carbon from the atmosphere simply by thinking about it. I think that we can stop violence simply by thinking about it. I think we can end suicide on a planetary level by thinking about it. 
I think that we can eliminate all fear. I think that we can build whole new ways of us living on this planet that where all of our actions, every single action we take is gonna make the planet happy. How do we do that? A bit. Um, people were saying in response to the question that um, uh, we want to have a more equitable society, a society where we're acting more like a, um, uh, a community, community growing a food, um, taking care of each other. Someone mentioned healthcare, et cetera. That we're acting like human beings toward each other. And I mentioned that I had a revelation uh, some time ago. Actually, uh, well, I have lots of revelations. One of the revelations that I had um, was at the uh, 15,000 foot level. Um, closed caption is back on. Okay. Um, uh, I had it, it was at the uh, 15,000 foot level in the Himalayas. Um, not a whole lot of oxygen up there. Um, inside of an old abandoned Buddhist uh, temple. And this other revelation I had was at my kitchen sink about two weeks ago. And these are, they're, they're all about, they're about the same. <laughs> And uh, one setting was a lot, a lot more uh, majestic than others. Um, this, the, the, the revelation I had at the kitchen sink was, um, you have to know how I wash dishes um, as rarely as possible. I try to get all of my, I, I use up all the dishes that are possible to be used and then I wash them all at the same time. And I've got to put on a couple of hours of YouTube videos to get me through this. So I've learned an awful lot, you know, um, uh, Sumerian cuneiform, you know, uh, astrophysics, whatever, while I'm doing the dishes. And this is my night for biology. And so I put on a, a video about ants and learn two things that I'd not known before. Um, first of all, the ants predated the dinosaurs, which means they've been around for a long time. The second thing is relevant to us and that ants were not um, colony beings at first. They were solo beings. I've coined the term solon to go along with Kessler's whole on. Um, they grew into um, colony beings. They grew into a hive and then became what is arguably the most successful being on the planet. Uh, they cover the entire planet except Antarctica. And I'll bet you could find some ants in Antarctica. Um, and they exist for the colony. All of them work as hard as possible for the colony. All of them exist with no one controlling them. Nothing controls an ant. Ant can do anything it wants to do. And so what it wants to do is the colony. Um, and I stopped, dried my hands, and I wrote on a piece of paper, um, colony humans with a question mark. That is what I believe, where I believe we're going. We have been trained and trained and trained to work for money. What if we work for the love of the colony, the love of our our fellow human beings, and actually the love of our fellow beings, not even stopping at human beings. What would that look like? What would it look like when you're giving birth to that? And think of all of the people who would be opposed to that. All the people who believe that they as an individual are superior to all other beings. 
Um, we're coming close to the time that I'm, I'm saying that we are um, going to wrap up. So I wanna say one thing and then, I'm gonna move us along. Whoa. Okay, I'm gonna say two things and that's gonna be because it's right to eight o'clock. So I've said that um, I've said that we we need to make this holonic consciousness functional. I want to describe to you what functional means. Um, some years ago, I was in um, on the island of Bali, and you can tell me exactly when that was because it was the last time Mount Agnon erupted, and all the Western press flies in, and all of the tourists fly out because Agnon is a really huge volcano, and when it erupts, it's it can be devastating. They were uh, monitoring, like the it's getting stronger and stronger. My insurance company is telling my my travel insurance company is telling me we're not going to cover you if you stay for the eruption, you know. And um, they didn't know they were talking to a lawyer. Um, and um, I noticed two. I noticed something. All of the Westerners were talking about how terrible the volcano eruption was. None of the Balinese were talking about the volcano being terrible. The B B Balinese were putting up signs saying, powerful Agnon, gentle Agnon. Um, uh, they were talking to the volcano like a human being. Um, like a human being that could hurt you, but like a human being that also can respect you. Um, and I, when, when you look at how um, we treat disasters, um, this is really surprising. And then the more surprising, oh, so, so the scientists were saying like, based on how the eruptions are getting larger and larger within a week, this thing is gonna blow its top. The army was moving people off the sides of the volcano. Uh, the most fertile land is on the volcano, but also the land is gonna get, get covered in, uh, in lava. So on the news in Bali, not in the West, um, the army allowed six priests to go up and spend the night on the mountain. So everybody, they're trying to get people off the mountain. They let the, the, the six of them go up the mountain. <clears throat> they come back and say, the mountain's not gonna erupt now. We talked to it and it agreed not to erupt now. It will erupt in 19, in, in, I'm saying in 2032, I think, 2032 or 2036. And the eruption will be twice what, it's going to, what, what, what it would have been this time. So you've got a number of years to prepare, but it's not gonna happen this time. And you can only imagine what the Western press did with this. Oh yeah, they went up on the mountain and they were shaking their rattles and they, and they talked to the mountain and the mountain's gonna stop. And they stopped doing that laughing because the mountain stopped erupting. Just stopped. And everybody's like, you know, thank you, Agnon, gentle Agnon. I'm, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna move about 40 miles away now. Thank you, you know. Now, everybody knows you can't talk to a mountain. 
except for the people who do. What breakers do with that knowledge, what breakers do with that knowing is completely disrespected. It is, it is a part of almost like the breaker religion to disrespect keeper wisdom. So, from the beginning, I was talking to COVID like it was a living being. And I was trying to get people to talk to the virus respectfully. You, know, you can be on this planet like you know, the same as us. You are powerful. You can cause lots and lots of death and destruction. I'm going to ask you not to do that. I'm going to ask you to mutate. And I want you to mutate in such a way that you won't kill us. Now, I couldn't get that through because there's so much fog and so much static in the line. We're so afraid. We're so afraid. And the, the, the camera comes back the next day. Are you still afraid? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm twice as afraid now. And uh, you hear that? She's twice afraid. We're going to come back and listen to her tomorrow. That, that kind of consciousness will never, ever, ever allow the keeper consciousness to come forward. And I'm going to curtail myself again. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, I can't curtail myself. <laughs> um, so what, I gotta go through these slides. Oh, like, it'd be nice if you could see them. Um, electricity existed for hundreds of years before Benjamin Franklin. And what most people did with it was play a parlor game. Um, and the game was, um, uh, they have this generator, this thing, a, 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 a spark generator. You put your hands on it and their hair stands up if you have that kind of hair. And, uh, or you could pass a spark around the room and shock people. And then, you know, you lit your candles at night and you went on with your business because there was no other reason to have electricity. The thing that um, Franklin did was move it out of the realm of a parlor game and become something that is the dominant force in our society. And he did that inside of what, about 100 years? Um, He did that because he was the first person to develop a functional theory of electricity. His experiments and theories made electricity useful. What I'm trying to do with all of us is make holonic consciousness useful. Um, and not barbecue myself in the meantime. <laughs> he came within inches of cooking himself. Someone followed his experiment to the letter a week later and died. So this was uh, really important stuff. Um, this was the first, the first um, electrical device. It was completely useless. This is the first electrical device based on Franklin's theories. It's called a lightning rod. How many tens of thousands of buildings did he, serve, did he save simply by creating something that uh, was based on his theories? By the way, his theories were all incorrect. He was not right about it, but at least he thought about it and got a whole lot of other people thinking about it. Okay. Um, So, 
After eight o'clock, we're going to be talking about a, the new physics of holonic consciousness and how we're going to do things. Um, I'm skipping through all the slides I'll show you at that point. In order to tell you one last thing I'd like to cover during our regular time. And that last thing is um, something I call disrespecting keeper consciousness. This is a really important point. We're developing a new way of thinking on the planet. But there's lots and lots of folks that do not want that new way of thinking come, coming about because it's going to make them question their old way of thinking. <clears throat> Shoot. And I'm gonna skip through the first one. Um, oh, I'm not gonna skip through this one. <clears throat> Right now, the largest pharmaceutical companies on the planet are, have their representatives down in the Amazon jungle talking to keeper societies and are asking them, how can we um, cure cancer? How can we do X or Y or Z. And because this is the consciousness of keepers, they say, oh yeah, sure. You want to, you want to solve this stomach problem? Like you take this herb here and you boil it down with this one and you drink it, smoke it, apply it, whatever, and it'll cure. The pharmaceutical company representative will say, thank you very much. And then we'll take those plants to New York or Washington or wherever they're based, put them through a gene sequencer, break it all apart, get the active ingredients out, call it pro something or another, and make $10 billion on that. And not one cent of that goes to that person who told him that goes to that keeper community. Okay. These folks get, these are some of the, the wealthiest corporations on the planet. He doesn't get anything. That's called disrespecting the source. And the biggest disrespect uh, one that it took me a number of years to be able to talk about without cussing is something that is called, um, it's, for, it's a video, and that, I see it's also a book now, on the horse boy. Now, uh, so I think it's still on Netflix. You can see for yourself. If I'm making this up, you write me and say, Sharif, you didn't get that right. Um, this couple had a severely um, autistic child. And how many of you have dealt with autism at all? Few, okay, you know what it is. And you know that, that some aut autistic, um, some folks present um, mild forms of autism. He didn't have the mild form. He was um, going into rages for hours. Uh, eight years old and could not use the bathroom. Um, they did everything. They showed his medicine cabinet where they, did, they, they he was just like a, like a voodoo doll for the pharmaceutical company. Try this, try that, try that. Finally, they decided that they were going to go to um, uh, Mongolia and talk to some shamans in Mongolia um, because they had the money to do this. They took an entire film crew with them. And so they are uh, filming them going to Mongolia, looking for someone who can cure their son. 
They call him the horse boy because the horses were the only thing that he ever responded to. When he, when he saw a horse, he would actually look at it as opposed to that, that blank look that um, autistic, autistic people can give to other living beings. So they talked to some shamans, they went to some villages and they said, oh, if you wanna cure your son, you've gotta go talk to the reindeer people. Well, where are the reindeer people? Well, they were camping over there a month ago. They would go over there for a couple of years and they come back over. They looked all over um, uh, for the reindeer people. Now, while they're looking, they have this three van caravan and th this kid is in the van, crapping his pants and going into rages. When you do that in your home in, I think they're in Texas, it's a pain in the butt. When you do that in a van in the middle of Mongolia, it's a lot more than the pain in the butt. So to make a long story short, they finally get to find the reindeer people. And they want to speak to the shaman, but the shaman won't speak directly to them. And that's a very important point. The shaman sends out an emissary and they tell the emissary what they want. The emissary goes back. And uh, the emissary says, uh, yeah, sure, the, the shaman can, choose, can, can, can heal your son, but he has to check in to find out if he's supposed to or not. Come back tomorrow. So they come back and they said, yeah, the, sh the shaman checked in. They said, yeah, he can cure your son and he's going to cure your son tonight. Come to the tent. And when they go to the tent, the shaman is already in his trance. He never encounters them in this world. They have to come into his world. And they showed, they, they, they showed video and part, they, they were, he allowed them the video parts of it and nothing makes sense to our Western eyes. I mean, he had some uh, rattling, he was rattling it, and he had some smoke and the, the things were burning and he was chanting something or another, but from our eyes, we're not seeing, well, I'm sorry, I'll speak for myself. I wasn't seeing it. And he says, okay, you can go now. That morning, the emissary comes back out and he says to the couple, your son is cured. It's going to take some time for, for all of the cure to work its way through. But two things you'll notice immediately. He won't go into rages anymore. He won't crap his pants anymore. And they're all like, yeah, sure. Um, a few hours later, they're by the creek, and for the first time in his life, this kid pulled, he's eight years old, he pulls down his pants and he takes a crap. And everybody is, is get the cameras, get the, <laughs> the, the world's first crap here, you know. And you can see day by day, this kid coming alive. He's first of all, looking at people, he's looking at them like, Where'd you come from? In fact, where am I? In fact, who are these people here? And oh, there's more people over there. In this caravan, there were children and he never interacted with the children. He started walking up to the kids like, oh yeah, you're about my type. You know, it's like, and so he literally comes alive over the next couple of weeks. This is all great. And then they get to the part where when I first saw the horse boy, I literally threw something at my TV. Um, they asked the father, what do you think made the change in your son? And he said, well, we're spending so much time together as a family on this, on this journey. Um, and there's so much like, fresh air and sunshine, um, and that made, the, that made, that healed our son. Then he asked the mother, what is it that you think happened to your son? 
And she said, yeah, yeah, we're, you know, we're really bonding together out here. And, and um, no one mentioned the healer. No one mentioned the guy in the cave who said, I mean, in the, in the tent, who said, I can heal your son. And then on this side said, I healed your son. And that's what breakers do. Even when they are the beneficiary of keeper wisdom and keeper medicine, and medicine in the broad sense, even when they're the beneficiaries, they still have to deny it. Even when they're getting it in one hand, they're still saying, oh, this stuff doesn't work. Can I have some more, please? And we have to plant this, um, uh, this new way of thinking, this new consciousness so deep in us that it can survive all the people who are going to say, Oh, this is nothing. This is all old wise tales. You have no idea what you're doing, etc. Um, now, the, the, the healer said something to that family. He didn't ask for any money. He didn't ask for t TV time. He didn't ask for anything. He asked for one thing. He said, your son is a shaman. He already is a shaman. You have to sew him the shaman suit. You've got to make uh, like a robe for him. And you've got to start training him how to be a shaman. So if that family, if he had said to the family, I can cure your son of his autism, but it's going to cost you $10,000. They would have whipped out that checkbook so fast. But the only thing, the only debt they had to pay was to raise the kid as a shaman and they didn't do it because that's the respect level that they have for that kind of wisdom so they went back and they found they, they got a they started a foundation in texas to heal um autistic children that had horses no shamans Okay, um, one of the hardest things I have to do, I have to do is um, um, prepare um, presentations like this. If I had 10 hours, I would not be as choppy as it is, okay? But this is, this is what I could do inside the two hours. For those of you who can stay, um, we are going to go another 55 minutes I then have to get on the road back to Portland. Um, for those of you who can't stay, <laughs> um, but um, maybe, and we'll see, we'll see about the possibility about me coming back. Um, it's been fun um, and it'll be uh, funner in about three more minutes when we get started again. Um, I would ask for questions, but you probably have some. Uh, so I won't until we come back at um, uh, eight ten. Now the same thing is true in um, for Zoom. Uh, if you need to take a break, uh, this is a good time to take the break. If you're going to leave for good, this is the time to take your leave, um, and we'll 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 see you at another point. And take our break. I'd like to open the floor to Yvonne Peterson. Yeah. Oh, you can <laughs> his, um, into his microphone and yes. into the camera. Yeah, right, right, right. Come on over here. And let me get rid of this here so we can see you. Okay. So I would just like to take the time on behalf of all of us, uh, the three programs who came together to sponsor this and bring you on board. I'm a uh, keeper. Basketry. I'm Chehalis. My tribal name is Tuni Moose. And I wanted to share one thing about the ants. What a significant story. 
the ants work with weavers because there are some things that we need to have them clean. So we simply put it on their hill and they will take it inside and clean it. Antlers, for instance, bones, for instance, that we use to make our needles and all. And the remarkable thing is when they have cleaned these, they bring them back out. They bring these out of the ant hill and lay them so that you can uh, then use them. So that reciprocal nature of how we relate to the earth it is a real thing in practice. So on behalf of our programs, we'd like to present you with a oh. cedar basket. Thank you, Where thank you, thank you. Of earth here at Evergreen. Now, Rebecca would know more than I, but there was a point in time here at the Evergreen State College, uh, faculty and students started a path and it was titled Consciousness Studies. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what has evolved from all of that work, but um, it kind of brings us back to full circle and makes me want to remind myself what were they doing? What were they really about? So again, yep. thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for coming. I will, I will treasure this. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. When, we, when we talk about holist, uh, functional holistic consciousness, we don't have um, an idea of that. I think it was Marshall McEwen who said that um, when, when computers first came out, personal computers first came out, people thought that computers was going to be television, but better, which means they had no idea what a computer could do. So, so um, hol holonic consciousness is regular consciousness, but better. And that's not what I'm talking about. So let's say, find out what I am talking about when I talk about holonic consciousness. Oh, we did all this part already, the Benjamin Franklin part. So let me skip to. <sighs> Some conclusions. Everything, everything is alive. Everything is alive. If you think it's not alive, you're not looking at it correctly. The sun is alive. Rocks are alive. Um, all of it has consciousness, although the forms of consciousness that they have may be completely alien to you. I look at the number of times beings are looking at me or looking at you and they're wanting something. They're looking and they're wanting a connection. And that connection is, we're, we, will do, we will learn how to make that connection. And I don't mean the connection that you have with your, with your dog or your cat, like, you know, you, you feed them so they must be yours. Um, <clears throat> all is connected and we're gonna find out where the connecting factors are. Mind, we are taught that I have my mind, you have your mind, and you can keep your mind separate from my mind. It's like, no, it's all mind, and we're all borrowing the same mind. Consciousness is universal. It's not just for humans. And this is the most important part. The laws of physics, of breaker physics, bend toward holonic consciousness. We can make the laws of physics bend. So if you're bending the laws of physics, what is it that you want to do? <clears throat> All beings have consciousness, including humans. All indigenous cultures, keepers, were part of the first global civilization. Shoot. We, we got to do that part too. Okay, I'm talking faster. Um, <clears throat> Breaker science is based on individuality, separation, and death. Keeper and mender science is based on inclusivity, life, and holistic thinking. Um, Rupert Sheldrake, when he, he said he was always in love with biology. So when he went to college, he wanted to take a course in biology. And so the, the professor handed out these dead frogs. And he says, I don't want to study dead frogs. I want to study life. 
Well, in order to understand life, you have to understand dead frogs. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, practicing inclusivity will create and accelerate the collective consciousness, this group mind. And then we ultimately have to blend breaker ways of seeing the world and keeper ways of seeing the world. And that's when the baby gets born. So the blended consciousness will serve as the basis for the third global civilization. We know there's going to be a third because the number two is going down the tubes. Uh, the fifth force, force X, we probably will not talk about tonight. Okay, we talked about Ben Franklin. Um, oh, okay, so. Um, I think we're gonna talk about Kessler and coincidence. Precognition. Yeah, we're going to go through most of this. Okay. Oh, we did this part. This is actually good, though, because I won't have to repeat myself. Um, oh, shoot. While you're bringing those words up, Therese told me that um, the, the, the work that he's presenting tonight is part of his new book. Yes. So we're getting a preview of the next book. Yes. Um, test audience here. If you all start throwing things, uh, I'll... <laughs> wait, Zach's gone. I mean, he's throwing at him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the five latent powers. This is something that I got when I was in that cave in the Himalayas some years ago. Um, <clears throat> I went there, I went there straight from the Great Pyramid, and I wanted to know how did human beings create the Great Pyramids? Everything you've been taught is wrong about that. This is not a tomb for a pharaoh. You couldn't get a pharaoh in there. Like you were saying about the passages, the, you know, they're, they're, they're cramped. It's like nobody would want to get, well, first of all, pharaohs were buried underground, not a, in this huge, construction. Anyway, I went there looking for the mechanism that would allow us to levitate stones. I went there looking for the mechanism that would allow us to um, uh, fly, to um, do the things that breakers say you can't do. And my second day in the cave, I've got a download, a major download. And it said, you're barking up the wrong tree. I went there thinking that there's gonna be like the magic clicker and that you click on it and then you get the stones to levitate or there's the magic song and you sing the song and you get the stones. To... They said the, the power to do that is inside of each and every person. It's inside of you, 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 you right now but you cannot access it as an individual. You have to connect your minds in order to make that happen. So that's been my quest since that time. How do we do that? How do we connect the minds? We know how to connect minds. What we don't know is um, how to keep them connected and how to keep them connected outside of our group, whatever our group may be. So five latent powers, collective telepathy and knowing, this is the big one. This is the, the, the holonic mind. Each one of you are connected to it right now. It's fairly dormant right now because each of you don't believe that you're connected to it. If we sit down and we start meditating as a group, we start chanting as a group, we start doing all the practices that most of the religions know to, to do, um, we would get that connection. And I would like to show you that if we have enough time. And I think we're in a time warp right now. This, this gets us to the third power, temporal powers. We're, we're, we're going too fast right now. The spatial powers are things like being able to being two, two or more places at the same time, being able to um, um, you know, walk through walls, um, being able to levitate rocks and things like that. Temporal powers, speeding up time. Have any of you had a, the experience of sped up time that 
time was moving faster, the, faster than what your watch was saying. How many of you have had experience of slowing down time? How many have had experience of time stopping? Okay. Um, communication powers, being able to communicate between other human beings without uh, any devices. Okay. Um, the telephone rings and you know who's on the other end before you pick it up. I mean, some of you have more than one friend. Okay. <laughs> Right, exactly, right, right. Um, uh, premonitions of either very good or very bad things about to happen. Okay. And then bodily powers have been studied pretty, pretty uh, uh, carefully. Um, being able to control your heart rate, control your breathing, control um, your respiration, control all the aspects of your body. Okay. Um, so Arthur Kessler did, he's the guy that did all this experimenting, experimentation with um, uh, coincidence. Um, all of y'all are in college, so you know what standard deviations are? Yes? Okay. So I pull out a coin, I flip it, it's gonna be heads or tails. Flip it again, it's gonna be heads or tails. If I flip it 10,000 times, I'm gonna get a roughly 5,000 heads and 5,000 tails. The difference between 5,000 and 4,999 is the standard deviation. Okay. So he created a random number generator. It generates a random number. He ran this through 10,000 numbers. How many odd numbers were present? How many even numbers were present? According to the, the, the standard deviation, roughly 5,000 um, positive, I mean, 5,000 even, 5,000 odd. 4,995 even, 5,005 odd. Okay, so, so he hooked that up to a heat lamp. If the number is even, heat lamp comes on. Number is odd, heat lamp goes off. Runs it through 10,000 numbers. Heat lamp is on half the time, off half the time. This is all standard physics. He takes a tray of baby chickens, puts in front of the heat lamp, runs it through 10,000 numbers. Heat lamp stays on, way outside of chance, okay? So the heat lamp is like on 70% of the time. Take the tray of baby chickens away, run through 10,000 more numbers, back to 50-50. Which means baby chickens are a lot smarter than you give them credit for because they can do something that you can't do. They can make a random number generator spew out a, a, a continuous stream of even numbers. You take them away, it goes right back to 50-50. Kessler said, I see what's happening, but I don't know why it's happening. Is it because the the chickens figured out how to affect a random number generator? Or is it because I can do that? And I want the cute little fuzzy chickens to stay warm. So I created a um, double blind experiment. He got a um, uh, two sets of eggs, one set hard boiled eggs, the other set fertile eggs about to be, about to be born. So he um, put the, nothing in front of the heat lamp. Oh, and he didn't put the, put the eggs in front of the heat lamp. He got another experimenter to do so. Nothing in front of the heat lamp. Heat lamp is at 50-50. Hard boiled eggs in front of the, the heat lamp. Heat lamp is at 50-50. Fertile eggs in front of the heat lamp, lamp stays on, way outside of chance, okay? Now, that's evidence of the holonic consciousness at work, whether it's Kessler's consciousness, the chicken's consciousness, the egg's consciousness, it's, uh, the consciousness is in there somewhere. 
Um, Rupert Sheldrake writes interesting books, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Um, how many of you have a dog? Does the dog know when you're coming home? No. Um, because the dog is waiting for you at the door. Maybe you don't have that kind of dog. You sure it's not a cat? <laughs> um, people regular, regularly report when they come home from work, the dog is waiting at the door. Kessler said, I mean, uh, Sheldrake said, let's test that. He put cameras all over their, with their permission, put cameras all over the house so you can see what the dog's doing when you're not at home. Um, watching TV, smoking cigars, the usual things that dogs do. And he put one at the front door so he could see when the, 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 the dog sits at the front door. And he got people with flexible schedules. They can go home whenever they want to. The common thinking is that the dog is habituated to the time that you're coming home. So around five o'clock every day, I'll go to the door because you know you'll be home about five o'clock. <clears throat> he took these people and he said, I want you to go home at six o'clock. At six o'clock, when they start, you know, putting a briefcase together, start to go home, the dog will get up off the sofa and go to the door at that point. The other theory is that the dog is habituated to the sound of your car. So he, he says, he has the experiment to call the person up and say, I don't want you to go home. What I want you to do is follow my instructions to drive around town. So he starts driving the person various places around town, including driving them right by their own front door. Dog doesn't move off the sofa. They drive a, a mile or so away and they say, now we want you to intend to go home and to go home. Dog gets off the sofa and goes to the door. So the dog can read the intention from 10 miles away. Now, how does that happen? Um, we know all the experiments about people who can um, pick, uh, th that animals can pick up the um, uh, pending um, uh, earthquakes and tidal waves and things like that hours before everybody else. Um, there's a story that happened when I was spending time in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, the 2004, I think it was, earth um, uh, tsunami that hit Sri Lanka. Um, <clears throat> the people use um, elephants in Sri Lanka basically as bulldozers, you know, knock down trees or pick up heavy objects and things like that. And the, the elephants are chained, but everybody knows the elephants can snap the chain whenever they want to, but, they, but they're, they're uh, habituated to stay on the chain. A couple of hours before the um, tsunami hit, the first wave of the tsunami hit, the elephants down on the beach snapped their chains and started running up the hill. And the people were smart enough, the mahouts and the, the other, the, 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 care, the handlers, et cetera. And I don't know what's into them, but we're going up the hill too. And as people started running up the hill, the elephants were picking them up and putting them on their backs. They get all the way to the top of the hill, get, get, get up to the tail to a certain point. And then the elephants stopped. And the, the mahouts are looking at the elephant like, what is this all about? And then they can see the wave coming in. And the wave came up to the point where they stopped. So there is something happening here. And I'm gonna see if I can skip a few slides because I am clearly on, um, oh, you, I can't slip, skip this one. We're not pizza friendly. Hmm? We're not pizza friendly. Well, I, I just stopped. Um, so, and now I'm going to start. Okay, so this experiment, um, it's pretty mind-blowing. 
So this is again, another test of randomness. Um, they take, <laughs> it's another chick experiment here. Um, you know that chicks like Benny Fowl um, are, they habituate to the first thing that they see. So the experimenters took these chicks, they, they exposed them to this red balloon moving around. They put the red balloon on a randomizer. So this thing had two randomizers. It, it, one changed the direction. It could move anywhere 360 degrees. And the other one was for, for distance. They could go anywhere from an inch to a foot. So um, they take the, the red balloon, put it on the randomizer, and so the balloon starts going all around the room in a completely random pattern. The chicks are in the room and the chicks are just are following this one. The, the randomizer, the red balloon goes over here, chicks go over here, the randomizer goes over here, it goes over there. And the chicks form a pattern. The pattern looks like this. Um, so randomizer starts here, cluster of chickens around it goes here, goes there, do, 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 do. there's no real pattern to what the randomizer is doing. Note that there's a cage over here. Second part of the experiment is they take the, the, the chicks and put them in the cage. And this is a glass wall here. So, the chicks can see the randomizer. And most importantly, the randomizer can see the chicks. So they put the randomizer in the center of the room and they run it again. And the randomizer makes this pattern. The chicks can't move. Are the chicks calling the balloon? Does the balloon have consciousness? What the heck is that? And this is something that I think that we should be spending a lot of time studying because this is how the world works. I believe that we're swimming in a sea of consciousness. Okay. One more time. I'm, I'm trying to sift through. Oh, well, this is such good stuff. This is such good stuff. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip so much here and we're gonna to go to, um, oops, not that. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to go to birthing the third global civilization. Um, you know what I probably need to do is make a um, YouTube video of the other of all the slides I just skipped because it's it's pretty good stuff. Um, so birthing the third global civilization. What is a civilization? Uh, according to the textbooks, it's the process by which a society or place reaches an advanced stage of social and cultural development and organization. Who says this is advanced? We don't treat each other like we're in the same species. We spend the majority of human activity in separating from each other and trying to kill each other. What the heck is that all about? Everything that we're doing is based on separation. And if I keep going this way, um, um, we'll be here till 10. Um, so we know that Western civilization 
is based on Greek civilization. And Greek civilization is based on one person, on Pythagoras. Every other Greek philosopher refers back to Pythagoras. Where did he get it from? So the textbooks that you and I read said that say that he got it because he was a really smart guy and he just thought all this stuff up. But he wrote down where he got it from. He said, I got all this stuff from an illiterate shaman from Mongolia named Abaris. Now he wrote it down. He said, this is where I got it from. And nobody believed it. So he's talking allegorically, he's talking uh, metaphysically, you know, uh, this guy, you know, couldn't have done this. But that's where he got it from. He got it from the land of Zhang Zong. And Zhang Zong, and this is all in a book called A uh, Story Waiting to Pierce You. I'm, this is the book that sent me around the world, so you might want to check that out. Um, Zhang Zong is um, where um, Tibet, Ladakh, and Mongolia kind of come together right there. Looking at this on a different kind of map, this is uh, Buckminster Fuller's um, Dimaxion map. This is the only map where all of the land, the only flat map where all of the land uh, all the continents are in the right shape. And he just unfolded the globe across the, 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 this is the North Pole, this is the South Pole, and each continental mass is its proper shape, shape and size. And um, Zhangzong is right here, but people from Zhangzong went around the world. Um, they left, um, went through um, like Malaysia down to Australia, into China, through China and Taiwan, into Polynesia, uh, down into India, into, into Africa, into Europe, across the land bridge, uh, into North America and South America. And there's also evidence that said they went also across the Pacific Ocean into the Southern part of South America that's called a global civilization. Um, breakers look for differences, we look for similarities. Um, we look at all of these people and am I the only one that says, they all look alike? Am I the only one that's seeing that not only is there, are their faces, their skin colors, but the clothing that they're wearing, the designs that they wear. This is, this is, was one civilization. Um, three different women, three different continents, all of them with, with uh, chin tattoos. Is this, what breaker scientists say is, oh, this is just an accident. They can't be in, in, in contact with each other because that means that they would be able to do something that we can't do. And, and, and I just say, get over yourself. Um, so they're very much alike in appearance, very much alike in linguistics. And when I'm listening to indigenous people, to keepers around the world, there is a pattern to their language. Although the language is different, it follows a pattern. And if you can follow the pattern, you can get the language. Clothing, culture, customs, all this stuff is uh, similar, including their values. The three values of Zhang Zong, reverence for the earth, reverence for all beings, including but not exclusively human beings, especially reverence for your food beings, the people, the beings that you, that you uh, eat. And relationship to and working in transcendent, transcendence, working in a transsensory reality, working in what um, our oldest 
uh, continuous um, uh, human population, the Aborigines in Australia call the dream time. So what are the values of the third, of the coming third civilization, our golden age? Relationship and reverence to the earth, the entire earth, not the local ecologies that, that keepers have been focused on. Relationship to and reverence for all living beings and all cultures. Keepers have been very focused in their own culture. Some of them make make um, alliances with surrounding cultures. But we are going to expand that so that it encompasses all cultures. Uh, a relationship to and working with the transcendence and the revolution into Holonic consciousness. We are one. The completion of Václav Havel's Velvet Revolution, where people went out and changed their governments based on what got called people power. And then they all went back home and the government snapped right back into the old forms. We're gonna come out and stay out. We become the government. Who runs an ant colony? We don't need anybody telling us. We don't, <laughs> especially experts saying, oh, you, gotta, you run the ant colony this way when they don't have any evidence of knowing how to do that. I think that was the end of my presentation, except for this one slide that I will leave you with. Um, Nelson Mandela saying to us, it always seems impossible until it's done. And then once it's done, everybody says, oh yeah, sure. I, I, I was with you the whole time. I was with you all the, the, all the way. Um, um, I was just uh, reminded when you were talking about the indigenous people who lived on this continent not being able to see the ships because they were out of their experience. The flip side of that was that there were very sophisticated societies already here, as I'm sure you're aware. And that um, the colonists thought that there was no agriculture here, but there in fact was a very sophisticated system of stewardship of the food and the land um, that was destroyed by them and that they couldn't see. Um, so I was just thinking about that as you were, as you were talking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's a really good point. Um, I did some work with the UN um, some years ago as a consultant. And they sent me to uh, Uganda. And um, I was doing community preparation uh, workshops for people who had been living in community for 10,000 years. So I learned a lot and they paid me. Um, but the, the um, the thing I was going to tell you is that when the when the Ugandans got to know me, they asked me a question that had been puzzling them. They said, why do the Americans want us to plant our crops in a straight line? And it's because the Americans, when you say a farm to Americans, land, you know, straight lines that go out to the horizon. And if it's not that, it's not a farm. Now the Ugandan farms are amazingly productive and they do, they need to do nothing to them. Um, upper story is bananas, right under that is coffee, right under that is um, various vegetables. Then there are peanuts underneath the ground. There are chickens and goats running through all this, eating all the dead leaves, etc. All they have to do is harvest. They just keep harvesting, keep harvesting. And the Americans come in and tell them to burn that to the ground, but it's not a farm. Um, it's our, and, and we know more because we've been to college. Yeah, if Evergreen became a, wanted to be a nexus for grounding the Holonic consciousness and we wanted to spend a weekend together of, 
all the things that we know to do to open that up. And we get enough diversity of being. Um, people, animals, like you have, you have, I don't know if you have sweat lodges here. Um, I don't know if they all allow sweat lodges here. Um, you know, drum circles, all of the other stuff that will, um, uh, that we can do and then, you know, do this both as a celebration and, a, and, a, and an experiment and see what happens. See what happens when you, when you um, pull all that together. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, hopefully my eyes will open right before I get on the, on the uh, road. I, I shouldn't say this right before I'm able to get on the road. I, I, I had a really smart car and I could actually go behind, go to sleep behind the wheel and the car knew the way home. Um, I would, I, I, the, it, I, I would like bounce up into my driveway. This was on I-84 I coming out of Hood River. And I'd go to sleep and wake up and think, oh, okay, I'm home now. Um, I, I haven't bonded with this car yet, so I'm gonna actually try to stay awake. Um, so thank you. Um, I enjoyed this, um, look forward to doing this again at some point in time. Yeah, thank you.
Gar Alkovitz, who has started a new school um, in the University of Maryland. Um, he's the third person. Uh, and another person who started another institution. Okay. Um, and um, it will start from conversation. That's which is where most things do start. But it started in consciousness. And uh, uh, I keep thinking, oh, they thought all about this and they thought that. And, but yeah, whatever it is that we are about to start um, is our time now. Um, I'm putting them away. One month, one place. Thank you, Angie, and thank you, Elena. We'll stop the recording now. Elena just said, thank you. It was great. Thank you, Elena. Yeah, um, yes, please. Please stay for the rest of class.